Welcome good people, my name is Joel Collier and today we're going to talk about what is a covariance or correlation matrix and how it's used in SIM. So before we kind of go into um, specifically what is a covariance matrix, we need to talk about what is variance uh, because that kind of sets kind of everything up. So variance of a construct or a concept you're trying to measure is really just the term to describe how spread out these values are. So if you're doing a survey and it's a one to seven scale, you know, are they all bunch around five, six, and seven? Are there a lot of ones and sevens and twos and sixes? Like, are they really spread out? Or are they all kind of bunched up into kind of one area? So you need to kind of understand how much variance is in the responses that you're getting to a particular question. Well, how do I calculate variance then? Well, it's pretty easy. Uh, it's kind of a four step process really just to calculate variance. So let's say we, we had a survey and we wanted to calculate the variance on age. Uh, and I had four respondents, and those four respondents were, uh, were 15, were 22, 25, and 40. And so I want to calculate the variance of those respondents. And so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to get the, the mean uh, of my, um, my ages here. Now this will work too for anything else outside of age or something like that. So if it was like on a one to seven scale and there's like seven, seven, five, and four, the process still works the same. But the first step I'm going to do is, is I'm going to get the average of all, all my responses. Uh, so in this instance my mean age was 25.5. Alright, step two is I'm going to take the, the mean um, and I'm going to get kind of a different score. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take each response and then I'm going to subtract it from the mean. Uh, and so that's kind of what step two is. So you can see with uh, the first one with age 15, I'm going to take 15 minus the, the mean and kind of get its difference. Same thing with 22, 25, and 40. Now in step three, uh, what I'm going to do now that I've got these differences is I'm going to square these differences. So in step three, I'm going to take, like for instance, that 10.5, uh, which is the difference between the mean, and I'm going to square it. I'm going to do that for uh, response two, three, and four. And then I'm going to sum all of these squared differences, if you will, up. Uh, and that's going to be kind of step three. Now step four is, is I'm going to take these kind of sum values of those, um, those squared differences and I'm just going to uh, divide by the total number, so I'm going to get the mean, if you will, of that uh, squared differences. And so right here, uh, our variance uh, across that 15, 22, 25, and 40, our variance score is 47. Now, that's kind of like a total value score, and for the most part, I mean, that doesn't tell me a whole lot, really. The variance doesn't. And it's really kind of hard to interpret too. Well, what you typically see is you're going to take that variance of 47 in this instance, and you're going to take the square root of it. And when you do that, it gives you the standard deviation. Uh, in our example, it would be the standard deviation of age across all of my respondents. Now that is something that's really kind of important for me because it's easy to interpret too. So if I take the square root of 47, I get 6.85. It tells me that uh, the standard deviation of age uh, across my respondents is 6.85 years. Then, So that's a little bit more easy for us to kind of understand and kind of uh, capture. And so first we had to kind of understand what is variance itself. Now we're going to talk about, uh, after that, what is covariance then. So covariance is really just how much two variables change together. Uh, when one goes up, does one go down? Uh, if one goes up, does the other go up? You know, and so, like, for instance, you know, if anxiety goes up, my happiness would probably go down. Man, they're moving in opposite directions. Where if my anxiety goes up, probably my fear would go up as well, you know, because they move in the same, you know, manner. So when you see uh, two concepts or constructs that move in opposite directions, they call that kind of a negative covariance value. It's moving in opposites. Where if they're both moving together, 
um, you see it's called kind of a positive covariance value. So when one moves, the other one moves kind of with it as well. The main function of a covariance value, though, is simply to determine directionality, and that's it. Which direction is it moving? Is it moving with it? Is it moving against it? And that's really it. So sometimes people think, well, you know, covariance is this kind of mystical term that's going to help explain a lot of things, and it's interpretable. Really not much, you know, from a covariance value standpoint, but just simply telling me kind of direction. So, you know, if it's a positive uh, kind of covariance, and you'll see uh, a lot of these uh, kind of results, especially in SIM, structural equation modeling, there's an uh, assumption that it's going to have a linear pattern with it, right? It's going to move it on kind of a line format, if you will. So if it has kind of this positive covariance, you'll see kind of this increasing kind of linear pattern, where if it's decreasing, you're going to see kind of a negative or this kind of decreasing linear pattern, too if they're moving in kind of opposite directions. So in this instance, if Y is going really high, X is probably getting small. Um, and so you can kind of see, again, that covariance kind of tells me kind of directionality. Well, how do I calculate covariance? And I know some of you are like, why do I even care to calculate covariance? I've got, you know, plenty of statistical programs that will do that for me. And you're right, and I don't hand calculate anything usually when it comes to covariance, but you do need to kind of understand, like, well, what is it then? Like, how does it get this value? It's great that, you know, SBSS and SAS and R and all these other ones will calculate that for me, but let's just kind of understand what is it really that it's giving us. So here's the formula for covariance. Uh, for a population and for what we call kind of a sample of a population, which is probably the one you're going to use most frequently unless you just have a full population, which is unlikely. Most of the time it's just a sample of a population that you're calculating. And, you know, I know some people, especially my, even my own doc students sometimes, when you kind of show them formulas, especially very big formulas, it's just like, oh, Greek letters, I'm just going to start to tune out. You know, like, oh, I don't get it. And so... You know, what I did is I kind of broke down the formula here into its parts so that you can see it's really not that not that bad. It's very similar to even kind of what we were doing in getting variance, you know, a, a minute ago. Um, except there's just kind of one more step now that's kind of added to it, all right? So let's use an example just to kind of put it in context. So let's say I want to see how many ads, advertisements that I run in a week, does it really make my sales of my business go up? So I want to see, if, you know, uh, does it have an impact? And so I'm going to track it over a four-week period, and I'm going to, you know, have different number of ads every week and see if it really, you know, uh, has any kind of influence. And this is a very simple model. You probably have to have control variables if there's an actual test. But, you know, this is just kind of simple, you know, does the number of ads that I actually run in a week influence how much I actually sell? So in week one... I ran, uh, ran 10 ads, it led it to uh, $7,000. Week two was five, week three was seven, week four was 12, and you can see the total sales that are out here. All right, so the first thing we need to do is you gotta get the, uh, the mean uh, at the, for, the uh, for those values of X and Y, and then we're taking the difference of those, you know, for each one. So for X, which is number of ads, I'm taking 10 minus 8.5, and I'm doing that for these, 5 minus 8.5, 7 minus 8.5, 12 minus 8.5. And doing the same thing for the Y value too, right? So I'm taking 7,000 minus 6,150, um, you know, going all the way down. And then I'm multiplying these differences here um, to, to get uh, kind of my, uh, these, if you will, uh, these uh, differences across the two constructs. And then with all these differences, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sum those uh, at the very bottom, and that gets my numerator really to determine my covariance between number of ads and total sales. And then I'm going to divide that by the number of respondents minus one. All right, so this gives me the covariance value of 5,566.67. Again, and I see that value 
And I'm like, what does that even mean, really? Right? Is it interpretable? You know, the only thing really that that's going to interpret um, from that particular value is it just lets us know that the relationship between those two variables is positive uh, and increasing. And really, that's it. It's pretty strong. That's a big number. Um, but that's it, really. Uh, and so, does it tell me anything about like how strong it is? No, it doesn't. You know, outside of that value, that 5,566, it really doesn't give us any more information besides simply saying, well, it's positive and it's pretty strong. Um, and so that's initially how we get the covariance value between two constructs. Now, again, covariance tells me directionality, but what if I want to determine like strength of relationships? Can I get that from covariances? No. Uh, I get it from a correlation. Now, what a correlation is, is it takes this covariance and it basically standardizes it. Uh, and what it does is it puts it on kind of a minus one to one scale. So you can see that our, our scale wasn't the same in this example. I had a number of ads, which went all the way up to, you know, uh, at a max probably in a month would be like 30 if you did. Uh, I mean, a week could probably be, you know, anywhere up from that. It probably wouldn't be anywhere near the same scale as dollar figure that was getting brought in. And so they're not even on the same scale. So when I see these values of like 5,566, well, it's hard to really even interpret anything on that simply because they're not even scaled the same. And so what a correlation does is it takes these values and it says, all right, let's put them all on the same scale and we're going to put it on a minus one to plus one. Minus one means that there's you know, a real heavy negative correlation. One goes up, one goes down. A uh, plus one means really, you know, maxed out. One moves, the other one moves with it. A zero correlation means rather that well, they're just not moving together with one another at all. One is just um, has no bearing on the other really um, in regards to to movement up or down. And so what it does is it takes a kind of correlation, and that makes it a little bit more interpretable for us, especially if you're standardizing it on a on a scale to kind of make sense of it. And so, well, what is that formula? How do you do that with a covariance? Well, the formula is you're going to take the covariance of that X and Y, and then you're just going to divide that by the standard deviation of X. Remember, we just talked about how to get standard deviation from a variance. Well, we're going to get the standard deviation of X and multiply that by the standard deviation of Y. And so, if the standard deviation of the number of ads was 3.11 and the standard deviation of you know money that was brought in or sold was uh, 1,844, then I can kind of figure out well, what's my correlation then. And so doing kind of simple math right there says that my correlation was a 0.97. Now again, we max out at a plus one and bottom out at a uh, minus one. So with a plus one, it says not only is it really strong, they're moving both in the same direction, you know, um, but you know it, they're moving almost with almost nearing one, with a you know a complete when one moves, the other moves as well. And so that's kind of correlation. Uh, so we talked about kind of variance, how that leads to covariance, and then to interpret it, you know, covariance outside of just directionality with strength is correlations. Well, how does this relate to SIM then? Well, SIM for the most part, I and mean, you'll talk about like Amos specifically, which most of my videos are on, is a covariance based you know, analysis. So it basically uses the covariance matrix between your concepts and constructs to determine relationships. Um, you don't necessarily see correlation matrices used. You can do that in Amos. But you really typically want to use the covariance. You want to use the raw data because sometimes when you standardize these this data, too, it can lead to slight variations in relationships that are just due to you standardizing the data uh, sometimes. So they're like, yeah, don't use correlations. Use covariance. Let's use the raw data. Um, and what happens is, is what Sim's going to do is it's going to do a comparison 
of the observed covariance matrix. Now, what the observed covariance matrix is, is it is a covariance of every concept and every possible combination. So, if we had this simple model right here, which was trust and satisfaction in a retail setting led to attitude towards retailer and your intention to buy from them, um, the observed covariance matrix would look at all possible combinations. Trust and satisfaction, trust and attitude, trust and intentions, it would look at all of them. Now, what it's going to do with SIM is it's going to look at what they call its estimated covariance matrix. And so, and see how well it, you know, compares, if you will, to the observed covariance matrix. The observed covariance matrix is looking at all possible combinations. The estimated covariance matrix is only looking at covariances on relationships that you denote. So in this uh, particular model, trust, for instance, is really only going to have a covariance with attitude because that's the only relationship I'm noting in there. So it's not looking at trust and intention. It's not looking at trust and satisfaction. In the estimated covariance matrix, it's only looking at those estimates that I have denoted in the model, if you will. And so what it does is it looks at the difference across the observed and the estimated and says, does the estimated model have a good fit to the observed covariance matrix? And that's where you get the term model fit in, uh, from it too. And so what happens is um, you'll see kind of this observed covariance matrix. And here's an example of what it would look like, you know. So this is the observed covariance matrix where it's, again, it's looking at all kind of possible uh, kind of covariances between constructs. And typically what you'll see on the diagonal is the variance of each one of those too. Uh, so the variance of trust, the variance of satisfaction, attitude, uh, and intentions. Um, and it takes that, uh, covariance matrix, um, the estimated one, if you will, and it just tries to kind of simultaneously kind of use all of these kind of calculations to estimate kind of real strengths of relationships. Um, and, and those relationships that come out are really kind of interpreted, if you want to think about it, like kind of regression coefficients. Um, but it kind of takes this, and I'm not going to go into the matrix algebra of how that, you know, this all works because you'd just be bored to tears. Um, but it basically takes this covariance matrix and then it uh, does these kind of multiple kind of simultaneous calculations to determine strength of relationships. Uh, so what you'll see uh, through this too is um, it, it's kind of the uh, under the hood kind of calculations that kind of run SIM and that's why it's based on covariances. Sometimes you'll hear SIM called causal modeling too. Uh, out there and that's really a misnomer because if you look at what is the foundation of sim we're, lo we're looking at covariances here like when one moves to the other move that doesn't necessarily mean that one is causing the other now you know, is there a you know when you're talking about is there an influence where if one's moving the other one's moving you know maybe even very strongly yeah absolutely but can you say one is causing the other one really no you can't you know you would need a manipulation to really show causation and you're not really doing that in the under uh, under foundation analysis of sim um, and so you really need to be careful using the term causal modeling because it's really not showing causation all right we we look at a lot of correlations in sim uh, you know, and looking at variances across that and covariances, but really not causation. Um, so that's kind of an overview of, you know, kind of variance, covariance, correlation, and really how those are kind of used in SIM to really kind of start running its analysis itself. Um, so if you saw uh, kind of value in this video, I'd ask that you uh, like and subscribe. There's more videos to come. And if you're looking for more information on SIM, how to run SIM, basic analysis to more even more complex analysis, I'd encourage you to check out my book, uh, Applied Structure Equation Modeling Using Amos. That's all I got this week. Uh, I hope you all have a great week. Good people. Stay safe.